at some point we are going to have to do a whole show about how good this show sounds. Welcome to Down Ballot. We do this show most Fridays at 7.30 p.m. Pacific right here on Twitch. That's twitch.tv slash Echoplex Media. If you'd like to support this show, head on over to patreon.com slash Echoplex or uh, eplex.store. You can sign up uh, to give monthly recurring donations both places, and you mostly get the same stuff at both places. I'm Producer Dave. You can find me on Grinder. Yo, yo, yo. Hear me now and understand me later. This is the councilman. You can find me on Twitter at T H E underscore council man. Very simple. Very, very simple. Um, if, if Twitter's still there, I really don't know. I haven't been on in a couple days. I should probably be tweeting about, you know, the show and what we got in the docket and maybe sending out some links in advance and alerting my 119 followers that, you know, things are going on. Um, but unfortunately, uh, the bad baby has been not so much bad as you know needy today so uh, i haven't had the opportunity to go out there on hootsuite and do all that scheduling but i i, I can do that late at night one of these nights um, <laughs> but anyway 
Long story short is uh, you can find me on the Twitter. You can find me as a Hansel Man on a, a Facebook. So if, if you get a friend request from Hansel Man, don't just delete it. Um, I'm, I'm your friend. I really do want to be friends with you. And I really want you to listen to the podcast and download it. And I want you to watch us on Twitch um, live because it's just so exciting. And the visuals are just the best. Like you're, if, you're, if you're only listening to the podcast, you are missing out um, on a bit, of, a bit of the show. So... Uh, you should definitely watch us live. You should definitely give us all the shill bucks and you can go to echoflexmedia.com to find out how to do that. Um, all right. Well, shall we get into the docket? Yeah, there was uh, no show released last week, not for lack of us trying to record a show, but we had some kind of technical staff snafu and the audio came out in such a way that it would have been, um, uh, if we would have put the show out, you'd have been like, what the fuck is this? Because it, it wasn't was the Russians. It wasn't. No, it didn't even sound like human beings. It was, it was broken. <laughs> completely broken but whatever the problem is i haven't been able to reproduce it and hasn't done itself doesn't done it again and now uh, we're live now and nobody's complaining that we sound like static so everything should be fine well lovely then shall we get right to it yeah this uh, is a story that right we this is it. a story that we covered last week that we decided that we couldn't leave we couldn't not talk about so this is a uh, san jose church ordered to pay 1.2 million in covid fines a significant win for Santa Clara County tonight. A superior court judge has ordered Calvary Chapel, San Jose, to pay $1.2 million in fines for violating the county's public health order. This has been an ongoing battle. It has reached just about every court level. But as NBC Bay Area Stephanie McGillon explains, it looks like this is far from over. The San Jose church that defied Santa Clara County's public health order will have to pay more than a million dollars in fines. A superior court judge on Wednesday ruled in favor of the county and rejected arguments presented by Calvary Chapel in 2020. They alleged county orders prevented it from exercising its religious freedom. What this case is really about is holding the most egregious entity that violated uh, pretty much every public health order holding that entity accountable. County Council James Williams says this decision is just one piece of a years long battle. A battle our investigative unit has covered intensely. They sat down with senior pastor Mike McClear. Well, Wednesday's ruling focused on mask wearing during the peak of the pandemic, which reduced the original fine from 2.8 million to over 1.2 million. This is a really important vindication of those community interests and really important vindication of the diligence of everyone, you know, the 1.9 million residents in our community that during the height of the pandemic sacrificed to help save lives. According to Williams, the county's health orders and their enforcement resulted in one of the lowest death rates in the U.S. But the attorney representing Calvary Chapel, Mariah Gondero, says this is about the county's pride and the fight is far from over. When I saw the opinion, I didn't break a sweat at all. I know where the Supreme Court stands on these issues. We've already won at the sixth appellate district two times. She's talking about what happened in August when an appeals court ruling reversed the lower court decisions that initially forced the chapel to pay up. The district court of appeal cited the U.S. Supreme Court ruling that decided banning indoor worship services in counties where COVID-19 was surging violated the freedom of religion. That same month, the Supreme Court decided not to hear a petition from the county, hoping to challenge the Court of Appeals ruling. I believe that this case is going to be a great vehicle on appeal. It's a very clean appeal. Gondero says the next step is to file a motion for reconsideration and or appeal the case at the Court of Appeals. In addition, we have appealed the claim we brought specifically against County Council James Williams for First Amendment retaliation. Also at hand, a possible new lawsuit against the county for allegedly conducting unlawful surveillance of churchgoers. A long fight ahead with both sides agreeing a settlement might be possible as long as it's reasonable. In San Jose, Stephanie Magallon, NBC Bay Area News. So I don't think the county's ever going to get its money. It's, you know... Less and less likely, the more this drags on, right? Um, and especially in the courts, as you get progressively higher up the court system anyway, it's becoming more and more Trumpian, right? So uh, you're not going to have as many friends in the higher courts as you do in the lower courts. Um, and it's already been diminished from 2.8 million to 1.2 million. Um, 
but you know uh we'll see uh but yeah i think you're right it's going to be a real hard slog to get the money if at all um they look pretty they sound pretty stubborn and their lawyer sounds pretty stubborn so uh we'll bring you the next development in this story as it comes to us but uh yeah uh any any thoughts on uh this you know pa- the pastor or this uh preacher here and what he could be doing to you know reap the benefits of this attention well when this first started i thought we were going to be seeing him on like dave rubin and maybe eventually making him his way up to like joe rogan's show like going mm-hmm. on that kind of grift circuit where mm-hmm. you go oh i've been canceled i've been canceled and he uh <clears throat> i don't know if he didn't try to do it or if he's tried and failed but with the one silver lining we can take out of this is that this dude failed to grift if he tried at all right, right. he hasn't become uh a thing right or going a going concern right he didn't yeah, turn I, into I, like I, sean I, foyt from uh redding from the bethel church or whatever you know right right i'm i'm curious to see you know i'd love to see their coffers and know if they're you know, if they were able to play this in some sort of way into more donations, um, in a, in a more private way, right? Not like necessarily going full Dave Rubin. Um, but, uh, perhaps, you know, through their normal channels and through other internal channels, um, if they were able to, re- you know, uh, c- recoup anything out of this, because they're obviously paying an attorney, but, you know, I don't know how much she's charging, but, uh, they're paying an attorney They They are willing to keep fighting this. So, um, you know, they've got some sort of resources coming in. Oh, that attorney seems to be pretty ideologically in line with them. And she may also be maybe running this at a discount so that she can go on like a different kind of grift or get more cases mm-hmm. like this going forward. Mm-hmm. Yeah, totally. She, she could be the, the go-to church defender uh, against COVID-19 restrictions. Yeah, I think that this... I don't even know. Is this, this might be like the, the last, like there might not be any more of these cases going though. Right. I don't think there's a lot of these happening. It's been a while since the, this all started. So there aren't, I'm got, I, I would imagine there aren't many that are still being, whatever you want to call it, adjudicated. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I would guess that this is one of the remaining ones. Uh, there've been a lot of fines doled out, but no one, nothing in the neighborhood of what they were accruing. Um, but the, the County, you know, We'll keep, they'll keep fighting it. They're also stubborn. James Williams, by the way, is the new county executive. Um, he's going to be taking over July 1st, I think, uh, as the, the chief, the head, head honcho, the head cheese in Santa Clara County. So moving from the city, from the county attorney's office or the county council's office, I should say. So we're going to move on to winners and losers uh, where there are yes, no, uh, where there are no winners. And this is, again, a story we uh, got to last week, but. Didn't really get to because nobody heard it. Um, uh, Bob Lee was the uh, cash cash app founder, and he was uh, brutally murdered in uh, San Francisco, stabbed to death. And the usual suspects, all the way up to Elon Musk, were like immediately blaming it on like drug addicts and homeless people and whatnot. And it turned out, well, as the statistics would indicate, the assailant was known to the victim. And uh, here's. KTVU Fox 2 giving their take and uh, San Francisco District Attorney's take on this. Well, the district attorney has some sharp words today for those who spread speculation that Lee's death was a result of uncontrolled street crime and lawlessness in San Francisco. KTVU's Janet Katsuyama joins us now with Brooke Jenkins' message and results of a new survey of how safe residents in San Francisco feel. Heather, the district attorney today said this was not a random crime and jumping to conclusions about the Lee case before police could gather evidence hurts the investigation. But she also acknowledged public perception that crime needs to be addressed in the city. The arrest of a tech consultant for murder in the death of Bob Lee ran counter to speculation spread by Elon Musk and others who used Lee's death to portray San Francisco as a lawless city. District Attorney Brooke Jenkins on Thursday blasted Musk and others for spreading misinformation. Reckless and irresponsible statements like those contained in Mr. Musk's tweet that assumed incorrect circumstances about Mr. Lee's death served to mislead the world in their perceptions of San Francisco and also negatively impact the pursuit of justice for victims of crime. We need to note that murder is rare in San Francisco. 
Thursday night at a public safety meeting held by the group Stop Crime SF in the city's Miraloma Park neighborhood, Supervisor Joel Engardio pointed to data on homicides. The most violent year in San Francisco history was 1977. We had 142 murders that year. Last year, we had 56. But Engardio says people's perception of public safety is important. What matters is how people feel today and they do not feel safe. On Thursday, the city released results of its 2023 resident survey. Public safety got a C-plus for the first time since 1996. In some areas, less than 36 percent of respondents said they felt safe walking in their neighborhoods at night. I was held up at gunpoint uh, in front of my home, and it was a shock to me. Uh, it was also a shock going through the criminal justice system uh, as a victim. John Trisvigna, former dean of USF's law school, says after being held up, he joined the Stop Crime SF group. This is neighbors coming together, some of whom are crime victims like me, some of whom are just concerned uh, for our communities. Uh, and we're working together uh, throughout the city. Supervisor Engardio called for creating a transparent crime database for the public. In Chicago, progressive district attorney Kim Fox puts all her data in the open. She lets anyone track the case from start to end with a comprehensive, transparent, and accessible online database. San Francisco deserves this too. And Chief Scott said today that another factor that is helping his department solve crimes is an increase in resources. The department staffing is down by about 500 officers, and the chief thanked the board and the mayor today for recently approving more funding. Heather. Right, Jana Katsuyama reporting live for us. Jana, thank you. So it was interesting how the story pivoted real quickly from, oh, the tech bros were saying this, is a, this place is a dangerous shithole to like, well, we need more cops, need more cops. People don't feel right. safe, need more cops. Right. Uh, it's kind of the narrative that's out there right now and they're trying to push, right? Um, and, oh, it, you mean what I thought was going on isn't going on? Well, that's okay. I mean, I, we still need to do the thing I want um, because cops, because we need more, because that's going to solve anything. Uh, yeah, uh, I, it's, it's perfectly... Um, you know, in line with the DA and the mayor's push, right? They're not, like one would say, they're not uh, tough on crime leaders necessarily um, because they're San Francisco leaders when it comes down to it. Um, but they're certainly not the progressive champions of social justice and criminal justice reform um, that some of us might want. Uh, but, you know, who knows? Maybe they're the heroes we need right now. Anyway, uh, it's not surprising to hear them lash out and, and defend themselves um in this situation <clears throat> well um, the, this public perception stuff it's like well if you have like <clears throat> the richest person in the world who runs like the platform that all the news people are on running the running the line that san francisco is unsafe and then the news picks up on the idea that san francisco is like unsafe and then all of a sudden the people think it's unsafe well motherfucker how did that happen Right. It's, it's a cycle, right? Like the, they pointed to the polling, right? Oh, only 36% of people feel safe. Well, guess what? You're reporting that only 36% of people feel safe. And you're, uh, all, you, all you do on the local news every night is report on murder, death, kill, rape, you know, and then, oh, kitten taken out of a tree, right? And, oh, what happened in the baseball game? Um, you know, that's pretty much the local news. So what do you expect? And when people go on next door, all they see is, you know, I caught this guy stealing my catalytic converter. And did you see this person knocking on random doors? And did you see that, you know, person of, you know, uh, of African descent sitting in their car on our street? You know, I wonder what they were doing, probably casing our house, right? Um, if that's all you see, then yeah, then that's probably your perception of things. And especially if you're Elon Musk and sitting in the ivory tower and, you know, just sort of, or sitting on the porcelain throne and tweeting, you know, then not really looking out your window at all and yeah that's that's going to be your perception for sure yep well let's move on to antioch apparently there were a uh, racist texts by antioch police and the fallout from that continues here's uh, nbc's bay area nbc bay area is reporting on it racist homophobic and misogynist those were the words residents of Antioch used at a city council meeting tonight. In fact, that's how they describe text messages allegedly sent by city police officers that are now under investigation. NBC Bears Emma Goss joins us live at Antioch City Hall. It was a little bit of a free-for-all there tonight. 
It was, and tempers and emotions certainly boiled over during public comment. And what I saw inside really was a city reckoning with what residents have said are years of discriminatory treatment by police that even Mayor Lamar Thorpe said has persisted in Antioch for far too long. It was a heated, at times chaotic, Antioch City Council meeting Tuesday. Mayor Lamar Thorpe briefly left the meeting, overcome with emotion. The central topic, offensive text messages sent between more than a dozen Antioch police officers over two years, uncovered by the FBI and obtained Tuesday by the East Bay Times. Messages like this one, where an officer wrote, I'll bury that N in my fields. And yes, it was a hard R on purpose. When you hear the this these text messages, this was in their heart. Yes. Yes. This is in their heart. Yes. And it's not just 17 individuals we're talking about. We're now talking about 24. 24. I'm not sweeping it under the rug. The mayor said he supports Police Chief Stephen Ford's decision to hire an external investigator. For now, the chief said that any officers involved are not working on the streets. He said the exact number of officers under investigation has not been determined. This is unfortunate. Let's, let's, not, let's not gloat in this. This is very, very unfortunate to the city, to this organization, and to the profession. A 22-year-old community organizer and activist told the city council she was the subject of text messages between officers. She claims they sexualized her and used racist language. You need to understand and educate yourself that the terms that you are using are not okay. And I'm honestly very ashamed to be a resident of Antioch. There are going to be some changes. Some of those changes may make people feel uncomfortable. I don't give a damn. Thank you. It's going to happen. About time. Is this the right thing to do? The city manager, city attorney, and the police chief have all assured the city council that an independent audit of these officers associated with the text messages is pending. But because this is also being investigated by the FBI, Police Chief Ford said that he couldn't comment on the details of an open investigation. Reporting live in Antioch, Emma Goss, NBC Bay Area News. Emma, thank you. For I wonder what's going on there that the FBI is involved. It's a good question. Uh I think from our previous conversations around this, um, what I recall, you know, uh, more than likely hate crimes, uh, since there was obvious, you know, racial undertone, racist undertones, I should say, sorry, not racial, racist undertones and overtones to what they, uh, they yeah, were overtones, texting mostly and overtones. Yeah. Mostly overtones, uh, to what they were texting racial, uh, racist connotations. Uh, they, th that could constitute a hate crime. Um, if they could link that, text about wanting to bash someone's you know brains in to someone who actually got their brains bashed in um that could absolutely be prosecuted as a hate crime um and that's a federal offense so that would be why the fbi is involved more than likely um and who knows when they got at what stage they got involved but they are involved now yeah so um hey more cops let's put more cops in the street i think that's a great idea well <clears throat> it was interesting to see the juxtaposition of the mayor's <clears throat> tone and demeanor about this versus the police chief the mayor was obviously right. kind of pissed like <laughs> right and the police chief was like well this is unfortunate and it's like oh unfortunate <laughs> you say <laughs> she golly gosh right yeah no he i mean the dude had to leave the room at some point it was just it got a little contentious apparently apparently some of the public comment got a little contentious too um and some people saying like everyone's just being too sensitive about it or something <laughs> Which is great. So yeah, the mayor had if the mayor had to leave the room, you know, there's some some stuff's going down. Um, but uh, yeah, good to see you know holding firm and saying you know change is change is going to have to come, and it it is. Um, I I just I just can't imagine like the police chief not coming out and say, saying hey look heads are going to roll like you can't do this like I can't imagine yeah. like like I can't imagine that not being the first thing this motherfucker says. Oh, this is unfortunate. No, the first thing this motherfucker says is you do anything like this at all ever again in the Antioch police force and you will immediately be fired. And we may find that if you've broken the law in any of these cases, we are going to prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law, no matter what your job is, cop or not. But the police chief, right. I guess, can't come out and say that because, you know, you know, politics. Um, although 
I would argue that they, the police chief is the one who, you know, really needs to come out and say it. Um, it needs to be from the top down, right? And so if this guy's going out there and saying, well, this is unfortunate, you know, and that's going to be the tone of the whole, the whole entity because it is, it is a chain of command kind of a organization, right? And where the fuck yeah. are the good cops at? You know, everybody talks about all the good cops. Where the fuck are the good cops at the city council meeting going, I can't believe my colleagues were behaving this way. We absolutely need sure. to. Like, where the fuck are the good cops? They're uh, defending the thin blue line, right? I mean, that's it. I think at the end of the day, we know. I mean, my question, my question was rhetorical. I know where they were. They were like, oh, I'm not so sorry. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I apologize there for wasting everyone's time. Um, sorry about that. Uh, but I, but absolutely, you know, I think we we should just hire more cops to send more racist tweets or texts and and to you know just be generally be more racist. I think that's a great idea. So next budget process, let's do that. Let's get that done. Um, you know, it's uh, like I just wonder, like, you know, what's the what's the violent crime rate in Antioch versus San Francisco, and why isn't Tucker Carlson talking about no Antioch? Yeah, right. Well, that's a that's actually a really good. Or leads leads to a really good point in that you know it's not as though this is this ends the the this scale ends in Antioch right or this this problem ends in Antioch I'm you know guaranteed their police and San Jose police have been uh, un- uncovered doing this engaging in this kind of shit you like, don't say tech, text yeah right text threads um, racists and otherwise uh, belligerent text threads misogynistic shit you know. It happens in every department, man, all the way from the smallest to the biggest. So to think that it just ends in Antioch is like, would be to be fooling yourself. So it's everywhere. It's prevalent in the entire, so like you've said before, it's a, it's a systematic problem that recruits people that want to be a part of that kind of a system, right? And have a mentality that, that will survive in that system. And the, and the few who don't want to be a part of that fucking shit, they get just kicked out the funnel at fucking damn near the top because they, 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 sure. they fucking they're like oh oh this is the score well right nope not gonna do like this the, and, and and maybe they got into it for the right reasons right maybe at the end of the day or or they just needed a good job and they thought it'd be a responsible thing to do right um right and they're like no, what do you what do you mean what do you mean this is what we wait what 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 that's not what it said what yeah, that's no, not I, what your recruitment ad said what are you doing right yeah can I'm i gonna, see you I'm for false advertising here. wait what's going on right i'm gonna go install you know microwave ovens and custom kitchen delivery well, this this uh, we're gonna go to the other end of the bay, almost the exact opposite end of the bay, down to Los Gatos. Um, this is the Los, Los. Gatos party mom. Uh, <clears throat> just <laughs> just real quick, she was letting her uh, letting her son have parties, which would have been fine, except for the uh, kinds of activities going on at the party where she was uh, uh, an adult and the people there were minors, and uh, she's in uh, deep doo doo because she was like encouraging people to have sex, uh, allegedly watching them. Um, there were sexual assaults that were alleged to have alleged to have happened there. She was, uh, not just like looking the other way if people were drinking, but providing alcohol, um, yikes. So this is just the latest, uh, uh, in, uh, installment of her court appearances as she winds her way through the penal justice system. Thanks so much for joining us on this Friday morning. I'm Chris Sanchez. Marcus and Laura are off. Our top local story now, the mom accused of hosting those wild parties for young teens appearing before a judge today. NBC Bay Area's Pete Serratos was in the courtroom as proceedings started this morning. Pete, prosecutors laying out some pretty disturbing details in those allegations. Yeah, dealt with some disturbing details and and emotional statements from some of these victims, Chris. Now, that uh, court hearing did just wrap up, and Shannon O'Connor, who we're talking about here, right, that so-called party mom um, from uh, Los Gatos, uh, she was in court today. Now, the district attorney uh, did present some of that witness testimony uh, for the judge to consider when it comes to sentencing O'Connor. Now, just for some background on it, she did previously plead guilty to dozens of charges, 39 charges altogether, and those charges include uh, child endangerment, providing alcohol to minors, as well as sexual battery. But today it was all about these witness statements. I want to talk about some of the testimony that we were able to hear. Now you have the deputy DA read about four victim statements. I want to point out uh, these victims were uh, around 14 years old. They were either a freshman or entering their freshman year. Um, We also heard from a few victims here today and their parents. So uh, it painted a picture of these parties, these alcohol fueled uh, sex parties uh, that she was alleged 
allegedly putting together uh, that was targeting the friends of her teenage sons. And uh, these parents talked about how she gained the trust uh, of these parents to allow their kids to go to her home. And at that point, those kids were given uh, heavy amounts of alcohol. Uh, there was one account of a kid saying uh, that he was passed, that uh, one of the kids was passed out uh, from the alcohol. And then another quote from a parent who said that uh, her daughter was taught to drink like a rock star uh, to take part in these alleged sex parties. Now, as far as the next steps, uh, on May 5th, uh, the WDA says that the judge will have an informal meeting uh, with, the district with the district attorney and the defense attorneys. Well, they will recommend uh, what the sentencing may be for O'Connor. And then they'll come back on May 16th and it will be uh, presented to uh, O'Connor during uh, that court hearing that's scheduled for May 16th. We're live here in San Jose. Pete Serratus, NBC Barry and News. Oh, they're going to throw the book at her. Oh, I hope so. It would be glorious. I, I do want to find out more about what went down, but um, at the same time, I want to respect the, the victims. And now it's like even more like, man, freshmen. I, I mean, granted, I, any kind of minor, whatever, but 14-year-olds, good Lord, dude. Uh, yeah, every every year younger, it gets like way more cringe, right? And what is, what? I want to know what the, her goals have i forget if we've if they've covered any sort of like motive at this point um up to this point or if we even know anything about that like other than wanting to impress her son right and, and be like and be like a uh, super mom right right just yeah, wanted, mom, wanted to be cool probably i mean wanting to be cool doesn't go away magically because you're an adult and you have kids i don't think that's true i struggle desperately to be cool all the time i think i'm pretty cool but no uh, i know i'm not um, I'm a full-time <laughs> Twitch streamer. What's cooler than that? Not much, bro. <laughs> Not much. That's the live in the live in the dream. Um, well, uh, wrapping things up here on winners and losers. Uh, we've got uh, following up on a story that we've covered not long ago, but um, uh, there has been a vote finally of the city council to remove a a statue that has racist undertones <laughs> in San Jose um, and put it in storage. And that, now that's actually happening. So this is the follow up from NBC Bay Area. A notable change in San Jose after more than three decades of controversy, the Thomas Fallon statue is coming down. Many local leaders are questioning the legacy of the one time mayor of San Jose. Here's NBC's Marianne Favreau. The San Jose City Council voted unanimously back in 2021 to remove the statue. And today, crews using jackhammers began the process. The 12,000 pound bronze sculpture depicts Captain Thomas Fallon raising a U.S. flag in San Jose on what was then Mexican land. Ever since the statue of one of San Jose's first mayors went up here at Julian and St. James Streets, it's been controversial, with some saying it represents racism and oppression. Today, crews using jackhammers began the process of removing the statue from its pedestal. It's something James Dominguez and his tribe fought for years to see happen. It's just like having a statue of a tyrant um, in the middle of San Jose, and we're trying to move forward from this and not move back. Gregory White works near the statue and is also glad to see it will soon ride off into the sunset. It represents racism. It represents genocide. It represents parts in history that, you know, of course, they need to be remembered, but not celebrated. For years, the Fallon statue has been consistently vandalized. Someone even doused it in red paint. Others fought to keep the statue to remember a significant moment in history when San Jose formally joined the U.S. The city says the cost of taking down the statue which includes traffic control and heavy machinery, is $450,000, and it should be gone by May 4th. Once the statue is removed, it will be placed in storage. In San Jose, Marianne Favro, NBC Bay Area News. So May the fourth be with you. My my take on statues and naming fucking coliseums and shit is that you should just it should just always just be for five or ten years, and it should be like installed so you can just pull a couple bolts out. Pull, pull that shit up with a crane and replace it with another statue with the same fucking bolt pattern like you put a new motor in your car because not not for nothing one it allows you to maybe honor more people via statues and naming of public buildings but then also times change baby and so if the times change past your statue well that's good it was gone 20 years ago because we have a 10 10 year limit on our statues i don't see how i i feel like this is the best way to do this shit 
right? Like if you could even bring the statue back after the other statues there, if you want, like you could rotate in a few different statues, like you do whatever the fuck you want, but like put some other fucking famous person up there for a while or put a, put an ode to the dollar there or whatever the fuck, like, like who's that guy more Moore's law, put him, put a Moore's law statue up where that statue used to be. Like, sure, you can have a inter- you can make them interchangeable too, right? Like a little pod- pedestal, and then something that like slides into the pedestal, and you just uh, you have a new uh, piece of public art or a sculpture or some sort of tribute of some sort. Yeah, I think that'd be kind of fun. Uh, and you're right; it, it's it's tr- <laughs> gets a little dicey. It, it gets dicey anytime you're naming things after people, right? And whether they're alive or dead. I used to have a thing about well, you shouldn't name anything after someone who's still alive, but actually. You know, because they still have time to do shit and they're still doing things right and it's just it's kind of weird at the same time uh you know once they're dead it's like you can't really do anything about their legacy so once it's uncovered it's like you're kind of fucked right you can't there's no massaging it at all um so i i'm just sort of almost not in favor of naming things after people to begin with um and because all your heroes are trash eventually or they turn out to be trash in some way eventually right um as the good wife would say so, so maybe we should stop naming things after people and start naming things after, you know, things and what they're around and, you know, tiddlywinks. Or uh, events in history, right? This is the, the coronation of San Jose statue. And then there isn't anybody on there. It's just like San Jose's like, like crest or whatever until that's a problem. Right, or like, right. You just name it after a fucking cool cat. And I do mean a kitty cat that hung like boots the cat. Never, never said a racist word because it just says meow. <laughs> Yum, 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 oh. um, So yeah, we'll, we'll see what can be done. I'm, I'm curious to see what happens in that space. I don't think anything's actually going back in that space. They are rejiggering the roads there um, anyway. So it may be that nothing goes in there. Um, uh, so we shall see. But there's a new little parklet nearby. So perhaps they'll build some sort of commemorative plaque or seal or something there uh, to, to commemorate that moment. And of course, if you ever want to visit that area, it is one of the more historic areas of San Jose, by the way. Um, not just the, there's the, the Fallon House, so Thomas Fallon's home, which is not getting torn down, um, is just a, a block or so away from that, right across the street from San Pedro Square. Um, and within San Pedro Square, actually, is the, and San Pedro Market is the oldest, I believe, oldest building or oldest adobe building in San Jose um, from the original Pueblo. Um, Back in 1777, when San Jose was founded, or at least when it was stolen from the native uh, Ohlone tribes, uh, and then founded as part of uh, part of Mexico. So there you go, a little history lesson. If you ever want to check it out, go to the San Pedro Market, have a nosh, have a beer, and check out the oldest standing structure in San Jose. There's a lot of good restaurants in San Pedro Market. There are. You can get some pretty good shit there, um, and anything you want, really. Um, I used to, they used to have a place that you make, made great poutine, but I, I don't believe that they're uh, they're there anymore. They had a club there where they had DJs for a while, but that got replaced by like a snooty Italian restaurant. If you can imagine that, mm-hmm. 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 Yeah, yeah, they replaced it with a snooty Italian mm-hmm. restaurant, so no more uns uns uns. Oh, more like oh, 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 oh. That's French. Oh shit! Right. <laughs> anyway, let's move on to get your shit together. This is a. Uh, Yes. I think you and I are probably going to actually disagree on this. I think this is great news. <laughs> uh, you might be surprised, but let's play the, let's play the clip first. Uh, this is get your shit together. Um, and I think this is just going to be like, I don't know, uh, sports. Get your shit together. Sports. Major developments from the Oakland A's tonight. Hello again. I'm Christina Rendon. And I'm Mike Meebach. The team confirming with KTVU tonight that it has reached a binding purchase agreement for land in Las Vegas where a new ballpark would be built. Right to our breaking news we go. In a statement released just a short time ago, the Oakland A's organization said, we realize this is a difficult day for our Oakland fans and community. Even with support from fans, leaders at the city, county and state level, and throughout the broader community, the process to build a new ballpark in Oakland has made little forward progress for some time. We have made a strong and sincere effort to stay here. The Las Vegas Review Journal now reporting this evening that the binding agreement is for 49 acres just west of the Las Vegas Strip and just about a mile north of the Raiders Allegiant Stadium. MLB Commissioner Robert Manfred telling the paper, MLB supports the team 
and hopes to finalize the process by the end of the year. The team and the city of Oakland really have been in a long debate over that proposed ballpark at Howard Terminal in the Port of Oakland. As for reaction from the city of Oakland tonight in a statement to the Chronicle, Oakland Mayor Shang Tao saying that the city will cease negotiations with the team. Now, we've reached out to Mayor Tao, but have not heard back at this hour. If the A's indeed pack up and leave the city and head to Las Vegas, the city of Oakland would have lost three professional teams since 2019, the Raiders, the Warriors, and now possibly the Oakland A's. Good. Good riddance. Good. I don't them. have a like I don't have a problem with the fans, the fucking players and shit. Right. Like fucking like whatever. And like it it's just business, baby. But like the yeah. when I heard that the complaints were coming from like the dock workers union, like primarily <laughs> about like the yeah. traffic and like they're right. it making their already difficult job harder with the new stadium, I'm like, why would you put the stadium there if like the that that port of Oakland is one of the biggest ports of entry for like products and products? in the country and like and not just the, the stadium like a bunch of housing and commercial you know office space and you know other shit that's going to cause more need for people moving right like it was <clears throat> it wasn't like nimby's being like it's going to be loud it was like it was like fucking it was like dudes with who still have names like sully who wear a hard hat and go work a fucking difficult and dangerous job all the time being like this is going to make it harder for me to get, get to work it's going to back things up at the when we're trying to get stuff out on trucks like there, this was like, this was like a no brainer not to put the fucking, not to put the stadium there. This is like, yeah. Yeah. No, I, it's not even so much the, the there, right. It's more that, I mean, Oakland's been bending over backwards trying to figure something out to save one or all of these teams uh, for whatever reason. And at the end of the day, I think they're going to find they're better off without any of them. Um, I think that uh, unfortunately Oakland has been played like a fiddle far too long by all of these especially the raiders god good riddance to them too um it's it's i it's fitting that they're both going to be in vegas now um just the most corrupt and and morally degraded and and destitute town uh in all of america um good riddance to them if they they sold the i they, i do feel for the fans you mentioned the fans the fans are the only ones i really care about and feel for and they don't deserve this and they have no role in it other one other than just wanting to root for their team but uh the ownership has run the team into the ground they're really really bad like they stink they're awful and there's like no one showing up at these games nowadays anyway um the true fans are staying home and they're not giving any more money to these asshole owners and the owners are happy with that because it just proves they're, they're like oh it just proves our point we can't make it work you know economically in oakland the community doesn't support us so we're going to go somewhere else where we can get support and now they're, I hear they're looking for public support in Vegas for, you know, financing for their stadium <laughs> or they might be down the road. And it's like, okay, great. Fool me once, you know, fool me twice because they, the Raiders did the same thing. Um, and I'm sure that they're not making their money back from that either. So, uh, good riddance. So I do agree with you. Like, I wonder if, not, like, I wonder if, I wonder if the, the way things kind of shook out with the 49ers stadium in Santa Clara, like loomed large or even loomed like in the background when the city of Oakland was like negotiating with the A's because, uh, by all, by all accounts, the, the 49ers stadium didn't go so great for the city of Santa Clara. Right. Right. Um, and that was with primarily pu private financing on that stadium. So the public investment was, it's more just been the public oversight and the public, uh, you know, the work that's been done since then right and keeping the Niners honest that's been the hard part um so yeah no I'm sure that loomed large and I uh but at the same time like they just kept Oakland just kept pushing the pre previous mayor really kept pushing trying to make this work and it you know it, anyone out, outside of the situation could see the writing on the wall that they were just getting played um to get a better deal out of you know Vegas oh we could say in Oakland we have this proposal for this gargantuan development on the docks <laughs> uh you know it, it at some point it just didn't hold water anymore and it was taking too long because the public process takes a while and they just wanted to move forward and vegas probably said okay right and the col the coliseum off of 880 is in uh in a bad way from what i understand it, it 100 percent. like they, they've had you know water backing up and rats and all sorts of all manner of deluge and crap 
So it's it's not a, it's an old facility. It needs to be torn down and rebuilt, or just torn down and something else rebuilt in its place. There's a lot of land there. It could be something really special. Who knows? Um, but yeah, they have opportunity. They have other opportunities now, Oakland, to do something good for their their people. Um, you don't need sports teams to make your. You don't need at least top level sports teams to make your city work. So there's other things. They can do. So here we uh, go. We got a. We're gonna move on to down ballot watch. And apparently, uh, the the story about the Los Gatos party mom isn't the only thing that's going on in Los Gatos right now. Right. Yeah. It's it's some uh some gnarly ass shits happening. So I don't know how we want to take. I, I I pulled some clips from a uh, their from the YouTube of their last council meeting um, earlier this week. I don't know if you want some maybe some backstory first, or if we want to run one of the clips that you know will give you all the backstory, or we just start with the code of conduct and we sort of go from there. <laughs> I like the idea the- of starting with them having to read off the code of conduct, like have a, a pre-recorded code of conduct. And then if okay. after that's over, if you have any backstory for what's going on, if you could uh, enlighten people, that'd be great. Okay. Yeah. So if, if we want to run that very first clip, then uh, a reminder of the, yeah, that should bring it up. I'm hoping that yeah, I got it. Signatures. I got Beautiful. it. Okay. Um, next we'll roll our video of our rules of decorum and civility. The public is welcome to participate at town council meetings, understanding that the purpose of the meetings is to conduct the important business of the town in an efficient and effective manner. At each meeting, the following expectations of civil conduct shall apply. 1. For the benefit of the entire community, the town of Los Gatos asks that all speakers follow the town's meeting guidelines by treating everyone with respect and dignity. This is done by following meeting guidelines set forth in state law, in the town code, and on the cover sheet of the council agenda. Two, the town embraces diversity and strongly condemns hate speech and offensive hateful language or racial intolerance of any kind at council meetings. Three, town council and staff are well aware of the public's right to disagree with their professional opinion on various town issues. However, antisocial behavior, slander, hatred, and bigotry statements are completely unacceptable and will not be tolerated in any way, shape, or form at town council meetings. 4. All public comments at the town council meeting must pertain to items within the subject matter jurisdiction of the town and shall not contain slanderous statements, hatred, and bigotry against non-public officials. 5. The town will go through the following steps if a disturbance results from a member of the public not following these rules. If participating remotely, town staff may mute the individual with an explanation for the record of why muting occurred consistent with this policy. If participating in person, the mayor may call a recess for violation of this policy, resulting in the immediate cessation of the audio and video recording and the council exiting the chamber. Staff will determine if the individual should be removed or if all members of the public should leave, depending on the extent of the disturbance. In the event that all public members exit, only the press would be allowed back in the meeting. Once the individual or individuals leave, the council would return to the chamber and the mayor would resume the meeting. Persons disrupting a council meeting may be cited for violation of the California Penal Code Section 403. These expectations of conduct also apply to meetings of all town boards, committees, and commissions. Well, that's uh, so. I you want to give a little Star Wars music? To play. You want to give a little Sorry. background on uh, why that's at the beginning and why it keeps mentioning like bigotry and bigotry and bigotry. Absolutely. Uh, so, loyal listeners and and viewers of the down ballot will remember uh, recall when uh, there were some. Uh, very uh, violent attacks, uh, verbal attacks, and uh, in in town council chambers uh, against a former mayor, Mariko Sayak, uh, who is Filipino, um, and her uh, her family and her children were were referenced in some of these attacks. Um, and uh, she was the victim of bigotry and slander and awfulness. And uh, in the moment, of course, none of her white colleagues stepped up to defend her or stop the meeting or you know, stop people from making these bigoted, horrible, racist comments that were um, uh, also referencing, you know, members of uh, the mayor's family. 
um, and th making threats to them. None of them stepped up to say anything or to stop the meeting. She had to sort of handle it all herself, um, and no one stepped up to defend her. And then, but then a week later, after the outcry uh, in the community, uh, and the community rose up and said, "That's bullshit." You know, you you need to, you know, we need to defend the mayor against this kind of shit. Um, the council and the white, the whiteness of the council, and Rob Rennie right here, who's <laughs> in the freeze frame, unfortunately, um, uh, or fortunately, who knows. Uh, they decided it was in there. Oh yeah, you know what? Sorry, we're, we did it bad. So we're gonna pass a policy that requires us to, you know, have this said at the beginning of every meeting, and we're gonna pass a resolution that says we're not racists, and we're all we marched in the '60s, and we have black friends. Um, pretty much. If I'm, I remember I'm, correctly, I might, I might be simplifying it a little bit, but that's sort of what happened. If I remember correctly, there were like altercations in the lobby. Uh, yes. after the, after the meeting where I think the, was it the mayor's, was it the mayor, the mayor's, uh, partner husband got in somebody's Correct. face because, um, Correct. the, they had threatened their partner and, you know, it's a very human and, and reaction. Child. Yeah. Right. Very much so that, 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 that did happen. Um, and so this led to protests and counter protests, but, uh, the end result was that they have a code of conduct and that has to be read and read off like a star Wars, you know, intro every, every meeting. Um, so that just precedes any meeting um, at the start of any meeting. What they're going to be discussing uh, during this meeting and later on in some of the public comment we're about to hear, we'll refer to it too, even though it's not supposed to. Um, but uh, is a uh, recently a, the council in their infinite wisdom um, voted to censure a planning commissioner, a young planning commissioner who happens to be the, uh, partner of one of the current council members who just got elected recently. Um, but they serve on a, uh, uh, city commission and they were in their own capacity, their own private capacity as a resident of Los Gatos, submitting their uh, opinion to, uh, state leaders about the city's housing policy and, or the town's housing policy. And, um, she said some things that, you know, rubbed some, old timey Los Gatos people the wrong way, right? And gave them a sad and, and, and gave them a little, um, made them a little cringy. Um, and so they pushed back, she got censured or they got censured. And uh, now um, after the ACLU found out about this and decided to you know, threaten to sue, the city is con the town was considering rescinding the censure. So that's the backstory. We're now gonna hear a little bit of um, the open forum commentary. Um, from that evening when they were considering this uh, the other night. And then we'll also hear from the city attorney or the town attorney about why it would probably be, be a bad idea to continue with the censure and they should just rescind it and not, not move forward. But first, public comment. Next item on the agenda is verbal communications. This is an opportunity for any member of the public, either on Zoom or present in the room, to speak to the council on an item that is not on the agenda for up to three minutes. So I have some cards here. I'm just gonna take a quick look. I'll start with people in the room, but anybody who's on Zoom, please raise your hand if you'd like to speak on an item not on the agenda. This gets juicy really quick, by the way, because they're gonna talk about things that are on the agenda, but they forget and that it's not the time I, for that. So for people not speaking not on the agenda, I have Jim Zanardi. My name is Jim Zanardi. I've um, been a resident here for all my life. And I have a question. I, I assume that all of the council believe in the Constitution of the United States. And I, I assume that you all agree with freedom of speech and freedom of expression. I would assume that. My question is, we come to this meeting and we sit, have to sit here like a bunch of robots and people can't express their opinion. When somebody gets up and says something they like, or one of you people say something they like, they can't applaud, they can't, that, that's just, that's China. That's what that is, that's China. <laughs> And that's wrong, in my opinion. And if people in the audience agree with me, applaud. Thank you. <laughs> what the fuck? He's like, At least he didn't take three minutes. <laughs> So verbal communications is their version of open forum where you come up and you have a chance to talk about anything that's not on the agenda, right? But you also, you know, you can't ask questions or get responses from the council or staff. 
and it's nothing and you, there's really no power in it you're just sort of addressing the item and if the council should decide to take it up at some point they will but there's really it's really just a chance to vent and that's what that's what this gentleman just decided to do the next couple okay. are pretty choice though thank you i do want to remind people yeah. that our job here is to do the business of the community in an efficient and respectful way and you know there are times when we applaud like for pledge leaders or when we give a commendation but the general way that Los Gatos has always run its meetings is to ask people to not react at all. And part of that is to show respect for somebody who you may not agree with. So if you have a large group of people where it can be very intimidating if somebody's speaking a minority opinion. So this is the way we run our meetings and I would just appreciate if we would stick with that form of decorum. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ron Meyer. I enjoyed the, I appreciate the mayor just taking it right back to just basics there. <laughs> Be nice. The topic I have for you tonight is regarding accountability. Um, Maria Risto, town mayor, Gabriel Wellen, town attorney, Laurel Provetti, town manager did not follow Los Gatos town policies and processes for the proper discipline of Kylie Clark, town planning commissioner. Their combined incompetence put the town of Los Gatos in legal jeopardy via an ACLU threatened lawsuit on behalf of Kylie Clark. Los Gatos citizens submitted complaints to the town council regarding the November 18th, 2022 email from Kylie Clark to the housing elements hcd.ca.gov with the email subject, Los Gatos General Plan Referendum. The 92 ACLU FOIA documents available for review on the town portal show a mayor acting unilaterally and not following town pol policies. It shows a town manager involved in the process where per town policies, she has no role in the discipline process. It shows a lack of confidence by the competence by the town attorney with respect to alerting the mayor that her unilateral actions could be putting the town in legal jeopardy. It shows the mayor's disrespect for the following proper town policies, fellow town council members, town citizen referendum sponsors, and signers. The ensuing chaos and animosity displayed in the mayor's correspondence with ex-town mayor Mariko Sayak and Town Chamber of Commerce Executive Director Catherine Summers shows a lack of respect for Los Gatos citizens and her incompetence in carrying out the town's business. The mayor discounted not only the current town attorney's advice, but the previous town attorney's advice with respect to following the correct discipline process as prescribed by the town's code of conduct policies. Kylie Clark's November 18th email which she claims is submitted as a concerned citizen to alert and inform HCD of the town's referendum. She states that the referendum was sponsored by a few which rich white and housing men and signed by town citizens for placement on the 2014 be 24 ballot. Kylie's questioning of the refer referendum's legality, a constitutionally guaranteed right, show a lack of knowledge. It shows an ignorance and an arrogance that confirms her inexperience, bias, and prejudice. Kylie states that the referendum's justification is their Los Gatos citizens' opposition to our planned housing numbers as we went above the state mandate, as this is our general plan, which we put a lot of work in. That's a direct quote out of her email. Kylie's use of we and our throughout her email shows the context that her that her statement that she was acting as a citizen is a false flag. She needs to be held accountable flag? for her actions. It shows that she was acting as an official town planning commissioner role. The town of, okay. town of Thank you. I'll let you finish your sentence. Time is up. I'm not. I'm just trying to be fair to everyone. Okay. Um, Final, just the last two points. The town count, uh, code of conduct policies provide for the town council to hold the mayor town council and planning commissioners accountable for their actions in violating town policies. I am asking the town council to hold the, the mayor, town manager, town attorney, 
and Kylie Clark accountable for their incompetence, actions, and disrespectful behavior towards the citizens of Los Gatos. Thank you. I got that. You got the, <clears throat> so I don't even know what side uh, this, because <clears throat> at first he seemed to be saying that the town council acted inappropriately in doing the censure, mm-hmm. but <clears throat> now he's saying that this person acted inappropriately and the town council needs to hold them accountable. Yeah, I think his argument is that yeah, this this um, this is bad, and you should have resolved it. But you should have resolved it in a way that didn't put the city in legal jeopardy. So every like they hate everyone. It's like winners and losers on this show, right? There's no winners in his mind. There's no winners at all here. They're all losers. Like he hates the person that wrote the original email, and he hates the and he's mad at the people who you know who uh, he wanted her. Uh, penalized but they went about it in a way that now has put the city in jeopardy and so he's pissed at them for doing that too and it it all feeds into his his narrative that you know government is corrupt and incompetent okay well during this next one i'm going to do a a thing that i rarely do during the show i gotta get up and pee so (laughs) oh there you go well you know what that actually sets pretty good context and those are the only comments early on that address this so maybe you want to we can click uh if you run to the next uh time signature this will be the city the town attorney is going to lay out sort of the background of the issues at, at play here and why there's just no point in them pursuing this um, any further. That, Okay, so that closes that item and it takes us to our final item, item number 17, and I'm guessing this will be a staff report from our town attorney. Yes, uh, Gabrielle Whelan, town attorney. Uh, this item is for recommendation of rescission of censure of planning commissioner clark um Excuse and me? i'll provide a little background Me? yes i believe uh council member moore needs oh, to i'm sorry himself. thank you i'm sorry yes so council member moore this is our final item and it looks like you'll be recusing yourself correct i'll be recusing myself from this item thank you thank you for the reminder and we'll say good night to you thank you good night wish you all productive conversation have a good night okay all right he is off the zoom thank you for that reminder okay now here we go thank you um so i'll start with a little bit of background um this relates to an email from commissioner clark that was sent to hcd um, regarding the town's housing element the town received a number of complaints about the email Um, So the town convened an evaluation committee to consider the complaints. The evaluation committee recommended censure based on the divisive nature of the email. Um, The town council voted to censure the commissioner on February 15th. Um, After that meeting, the town was contacted by the American Civil Liberties Union and the American Civil Liberties Union referred the town to case law that protects First Amendment rights of public officials when they're commenting in their private capacity. Um, I have reviewed the case law provided by the ACLU, and based on that case law, I am recommending that the council rescind the censure. Um, This would include rescinding the town council's verbal censure as well as the letter from the evaluation committee to Commissioner Clark. Um, It would also include a statement that the counseling that was provided to the commissioner um, was not warranted and will not not be provided in the future for um, comments that are made in an official's private capacity. And this is obviously a complicated issue, and so I'm available for questions. Oh, no. Thank you. I imagine there will be questions. <laughs> Council I'm available for questions. Sounds bad. Uh, thank you, um, Ms. Whalen. Uh, in the um, evaluation committee and then in the February 15th disciplinary hearing, um, there were questions about conflict of interest uh, in that Ms. Clark represented that she does housing work in certain communities and when asked um, repeatedly she answered that she does housing work uh, for West Valley Community Services in Los Gatos. Um, I don't see anything about that in the staff report and I didn't see anything about that in the original um, 
evaluation. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't see anything about the that conflict of interest and her um, Ms. Clark's uh, responses on that matter. Um, is is there a reason why uh, we're not addressing the potential conflict of interest? So the conflict of interest um, is based on the State Political Reform Act, and that's based on a public official source of income. Uh, when the complaints were initially submitted, um, I reviewed the complaints against the, pub the uh, Political Reform Act, and it appeared to me that West Valley Community Services was involved in s providing services to the homeless. Um, that did not appear to constitute a conflict of interest with the commissioner's duties as a planning commissioner. Um, if I may, as a follow-up, um, if I may, the question was about the her answers to questions that were given during the February fifteenth hearing, where she stated that she does housing work in communities, and when asked. Um, is she employed, uh, does she do, uh, is she paid to do housing work by West Valley Community Services? Um, she answered yes. So is that, you know, again, it was, I'm not going back to the information that you uh, researched for the evaluation. I'm, I'm talking about the information that came out subsequently in the hearing. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, I would recommend that the council consider conflict of interest questions separate from the complaints that were received regarding the email to HCD. Um, and that's definitely an avenue that the council could could choose is to review um, any potential conflicts of interest for all planning commissioners. Thank you. He obviously voted for the censure. Council member Rennie. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh. Okay, Councilmember. Um, so, some questions. Your your report. You're recommending that we re uh. rescind our censure. Um, yes. And I'm. I don't know that you mentioned. It. I'm. I'm assuming that that's because we're concerned ACLU might sue us to force us to rescind the censure. And um, that's correct. What what is what's the percent chance? I know this is a guess that you think they would sue us. Um, I think what's it's this? like a hundred percent. I've had numerous conversations with representatives from ACLU. I would say it's a hundred percent certainty. <laughs> okay, so if we did get in a lawsuit with them, is it an open shut case, or do we, you know, have any ground to stand on? Um, or not re not resending our censure. So they're not even firing this person or anything, right? They just said you've been a you've been naughty. That's what a censure is, right? Correct. And this is like not even an employee. This is an appointed person who they have appointed to the planning commission, right? Um, so just serving the city ostensibly, and then and in their capacity as a private citizen, right? Uh, offering comment on the city's housing policy, which is entirely their right. They have. They have a role in the commission, but they don't have, you know, it doesn't you know, preclude them from having opinions. Um, and if they want to voice them, they're free to do that. And she did that. And, uh, but it, again, it got some folks underpants in and uh, all bundled up and uh, they had, they complained. And that's just the reactive city council once again um, reacted. Are we willing to get into a potentially very expensive lawsuit with a historically powerful and well-funded organization over telling somebody, oh, no, you didn't. Yeah, it prob probably not a good idea. <laughs> but that's, that's what the town attorney is about, basically telling them right here. This You can really tell. I mean, the, the, the humility here is just deep, right? The humble pie that she's having to eat um, because she more than likely did not advise them well enough the first time around um, when they were doing the censure and she should have warned them of this to begin with. Um, and now, now she's like, I was, I've been foiled by the ACLU. <laughs> she's probably burning her. Well, in a nutshell, there's like two main cases that apply in this situation. Um, the first is Bond versus Floyd. And that stands for the proposition that a public official is free to exercise their First Amendment right um, to say anything in their capacity as a private citizen. 
Um, there is a recent case out of Houston um, involving a community college district that censured one of its own board members. Um, that's a very recent case, and the Supreme Court held that the board was free to exercise its own First Amendment right to censure one of its own members. Um, however, that court stopped short of saying that um, board members could censure members of subordinate bodies, um, and the court reasoned that it would have the effect of chilling the exercise of those free speech rights. Um, and so, based on the fact that there's no precedent upholding um, a board or council um, from censuring members of subordinate bodies for speech made in their private capacity. Um, I think that the, the town would probably lose the litigation. And if we lost, what would that cost us? Um, so this guy's like, this guy's like, okay, so, but, but, but like, if we, if we, I still want to be a dick. So, <laughs> what's the cost of me being a dick? Right. I'd like to. <laughs> That's basically what he's asking. I'd like to. I'd like to stand my ground here anyway. What is the exposure? Right. How much can I like help you guys cover that? Like, similar <laughs> litigation. I understand that the costs have reached as high as three hundred and seventy-five thousand um, dollars, and that was based on a First Amendment lawsuit brought by the ACLU in another jurisdiction. Is oh, that same lawyer is going to cost triple that in Los Gatos. Don't get it twisted. For show. For <laughs> show. Of what our cost would be and attorney's fees that, that would, would be, be awarded. Attorney's fees and costs um, for the plaintiff. Um, that does not include the cost to the town for the town's defense counsel. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> okay. I think we can. That's yeah. amazing. People in the chat yeah. are like, who needs Shasta when you have Los Gatos? And for people who aren't aware, Los Gatos is one of the most desirable places in the Bay Area to live. Yes, very much so. It's an enclave. It is a, a, a gem uh, in the foothills, um, and it's uh, it's it's home to many, many, like uh, the planning commissioner said, rich white men and women um, who throw their weight around uh, as the biggest NIMBYs imaginable, um, but would never claim to be NIMBYs, right? We're welcoming and inclusive. We're Los Gatos. Los Gatos. Um, like Waz, Waz's primary residence is there if people want to have like some uh, uh, <clears throat> idea of who lives there. Um, yeah. Sure like, well, it, sure, like there's like condos and regular houses down in the flats, and that's where most of the people live, but that's still expensive as fuck. But the, yeah, the well, other thing is there's the hills, and the people that live in the hills, those yeah. people are filthy rich. Yeah. But then if you get too far into the hills, then it becomes a wholly different story. But we'll talk about that in another down ballot. But um, yeah, I highly recommend if you want to know about the people who live in Los Gatos, or at least people that uh, come to Los Gatos Town Council meetings, please continue watching. Um, follow that clip uh, link and keep, keep watching for the public comment on that item. It goes on for about an hour. So I did, we definitely don't have the time for that tonight. But if you do have an hour or so to spare, just put it on and just listen to the gloriousness. There's some folks on our side from the, the side of good and the planning commissioner herself speaks later on too. So stay tuned and, and keep watching. Ooh, I may, I may, I may move that on. Uh, I may move that on over to the uh, random late night video docket when I get a chance. Cause you may have to, yeah, it'd be a good after party or a good, uh, a good, a uh, post docket. Kind of a well, video. And we've also been thinking about what to do with Tuesday night. And we've been thinking about starting to do a show called public comment and do like, do like uh, a, a good two or three hours of, local government meetings from across the country before we that's do, like, cool yeah it would be good on tuesdays you know tuesdays are generally a, a government meeting day so that's great that's actually a really good night for it <laughs> we'd be able to catch some of it live we'd be able to catch some of the san jose one live we'd be able to sometimes uh go over some of the stuff that happened in shasta sure and uh just other stuff we'd be able to cover uh keep an eye out for that everybody that one might be able to be edited down into a podcast to like a companion to down ballot so we'll have to think oh. about it though we'll have to think about it though we're going to move on mm -hmm. to and another thing. This is a usually a human or an animal interest story. This time it's a human interest story, and I am fucking stoked on this. Considering all the bad shit that's going on around uh, queer issues, particularly our uh, transgender uh, neighbors and uh, friends and family members, this is California crowns the first transgender Miss San Francisco, and if she isn't just the loveliest fucking thing, my God. 
Trisha. Well, it's Women's History Month, and we are celebrating at Cron 4. This month, the Bay Area crowned its new Miss San Francisco. She's also the first transgender woman to earn a title in the organization's 99-year history. Monroe Lace joins me live right now. Thank you so much for joining us bright and early this morning. Thank you so much for having me. This is so amazing. And tell us a bit about what it felt like to win the crown, to win the title. Oh my gosh, I am literally still in disbelief. This mm -hmm. is like such a dream come true. I've been dreaming about this since I was 12 years old. And so when the crown was placed on my head, I, I was just... I was just in shock. Do you walk <laughs> us through that moment? Yeah, I mean, like I said, I've been dreaming about it for so long. So when that when the crown was placed on my head, I literally was like, "This isn't real life," and I was like crying. <laughs> all, all the pictures of me are like me just like Aww. crying and like seeing all my friends in the audience made it even more special. But looking gorgeous at the same time through oh, all those you, tears. Thank you. <laughs> and you know, tell us a bit about your story as well because it's quite unique and how you how that led you to compete for the title. Yeah, well, four years ago, I ran away from home and I was homeless. And two years ago, I was assaulted at gunpoint. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, to me, if I'm able to inspire a child who sees me and thinks to herself, I'm going to be okay, then I've done my job with or without the sash and crown. Wow. And uh, did, did you share that story while you were in the running for Miss uh, San Francisco? I did. And what was that process like? Yeah, I mean, I knew going into competing in the Miss America organization that I wanted to be true to myself because I knew that there was a little girl out there or a little child out there watching me. And I wanted them to know that if I can do it, they can too. Where do you find the inspiration to speak up for yourself? Where, where does that courage come from? Because it's not easy to share such, uh, you know, to share stories of trauma. Yeah. You know, I think it comes from thinking about all the other um, survivors, all the other children who um, are at home and are going through exactly what I'm going through. And if I can be a voice for others, um, if I can in some way help those that have been harmed feel less alone and less ashamed, and so that they don't have to carry that burden on their shoulders alone and in silence, then I want to be able to use that platform. And Monroe, you identify as being part of the trans community. Um, yeah. Tell us a bit about how that shaped your experience in the pageant. Yeah, I mean, I am so blessed to be part of an organization that really strives for diversity. And I think what makes um, Miss America so special is the sisterhood, that no matter who you are or where you come from, whether you represent a city like San Francisco or a rural town, um, we are all bonded to together because of our passion for service style, success, and scholarship. And so I think every woman in this organization um, represents a part of America, and Miss America represents the best in all of us. And uh, that's a beautiful message. And this is Women's History Month, of course. Um, we're at this time when women have gained so many privileges, and yet it seems like at the same It'll time, right. privileges are being taken away. Um, what is your hope for the future, and are there any changes you'd like to see? Hmm. You know, I, I'd say, I would love to see more parity, more gender parity in, in the workforce, particularly in law. Um, my career ambition is to be a deputy district attorney and hopefully run to be a judge in the same courthouse my dad cleans as a janitor. Mm -hmm. And as someone who hopes to join the bar and eventually the bench, um, that is something that I would love to see more of, more women in, in, in white collar professions. And uh, last question here, you're going on to compete for Miss California yes. in June. How are you getting ready? I am so excited. I am ready to bring the glamour to the Miss California <laughs> stage. It. I'm ready to strut my stuff on stage. Anything that involves me walking and looking good and feeling good, I'm, that's what I'm looking forward to. <laughs> you certainly already are a role model for so many. Thank, thank you, you so much. Um, so, thank you so much to Monroe Lace, Miss San Francisco. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Hell yeah. Stephanie. <clears throat> <clears throat> Hell yeah. The only way that could have been better is if she'd have been like, and uh, you know, just so you know, the first gay, uh, the, the, the first gay pride event was a, a trans person throwing a brick. <laughs> so mm -hmm. <laughs> be like, just, just be ready to throw a brick if you have to. Just throwing it out there. Hey, I'll throw some bricks for her, too. Like, if she wants to run for something, I'm all about it. So I'll, if I can vote uh, in, in the jurisdiction, I'll be there. So if she wants to run for president, who knows? Saying all the right things. And I don't know um, if there's a, I don't know if there's a public voting part of Miss California or whatever, but if there, if there is, I would encourage our audience who are in California to get involved if they can and maybe vote for Miss San Francisco because she seems lovely.
Let's do it. There's got to be something like that these days. You imagine, um, like the voice or something. Anyway, uh, I'm not yeah, into, great I'm not human in, interest story. I'm not into pageants, but I am into inclusivity. And right now, especially with everything that's going on with, with the trans community, um, you know, this is this is good to see. And it's good to see that Miss America yeah. is like going the right way on this shit. The right. Miss America pageant, a, a very old legacy organization, hundred percent is going the right way. And I I bet with with no small amount of pushback from a bunch of old fucking bigots. So old. Well, um, we love pushing back on old bigots here in down ballot. That's what we do. Um, <laughs> uh, so uh, thank you for sticking around for another week. Producer Dave, uh, should we read it out this evening? Do you want to do the honors? And you go ahead. All right. Well, thank you again. Like I said, uh, every Friday, well, almost every Friday and most every Friday at 7.30 Pacific. You can find us on Twitch right here. You can also download the podcast whenever Producer Dave gets around to doing that business. Um, I would highly encourage you to do both because you get the full perspective. Um, and obviously go to echoplexmedia.com uh, support page to learn how you can give us a few bucks just to keep the the signals rolling and the, the wheels spinning and the gears turning and hopefully keep us from sounding like gobbledygook. Um, once again, uh, this is the councilman on behalf of producer dave i wish you all a pleasant weekend please uh you know get yourself vaxxed wear a mask um if you feel like it and then pants are completely optional this is audible smoke and you're listening to echoplex media stay tuned for conspiracy bingo if you tuned in live bam <laughs> To get the party started Pick up my phone Just to check and see who's calling Dress up real nice For the ladies at the bar And I'm driving in my car Just to get to where they are Here at the local scene Is where I plant my feet Is where I smoke my cigarette And I hold my drink I look at all my friends They're all blazing greens Here at the front of the stage Waiting for Red TV Where are those guys Who's standing next to me With the pipe in his hand Ready to blaze for me About five minutes later We're all singing We to get the fuck up on they like the sea, yeah We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Enjoy that band I turn and head back to the bar for a refill, man, because you know where we are. We're headed out to the car to smoke another one and another one. Now, just when the magic starts kicking in, I hear we left playing, and you know it's time to head in. All right, everybody, now it's time to grab a new drink, spark it if you got it, and then pass it to me. Yeah. We do what we want. And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We do what we want What we want to do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Enjoy that band Last up on the field for the show tonight It's down and dirty in five So we're headed outside To spark up another joint Now who's got my light? A stoner E, of course Shouldn't you be inside? I'm all up in this bitch being who I gotta be I'm fucked up like the US economy The truth is is that I don't think logically Stone to E take you on a psychedelic odyssey Now inside motherfuckers is rocking me And outside shit we smoke a lot of broccoli Rock and roll of your sexy groovy jockin' me Ain't too drunk to fuck but I'm probably do a stop We do what we want and what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band Dance with the band and enjoy the band We do what we want And what we want to do And what we want is to jam So sit back and enjoy the band We want the what we want to do.
on is the jam, so sit back and enjoy the band. So sit back and enjoy